Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come into your presence this morning, and we thank you that you are not a God who is silent, but that you have indeed spoken to us through your word. And so we ask, as we open up your word this morning, that you would give us eyes to see you, ears to hear you, and hearts to receive you. Uh, Speak to us, Lord, this morning. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I don't know if anything that I can say uh, could make quite the statement as uh, seeing Pastor Aaron uh, put a phone in the fire. That that, that says perhaps in some ways all that uh, that can be said on the topic. But nevertheless, I invite you to open up your Bible or your Bible app to the book of 1 Kings chapter 19. We're going to be looking at verses 19 through 21. Uh, This morning, as many of you know, marks the first Sunday of the season of Lent when we turn our eyes toward Jesus' road that led him to Jerusalem and to the events of Holy Week. This week, we also mark the beginning of a new sermon series on Elisha and the walk of faith. So during the weeks ahead, as we journey forward into the season of Lent, we're also going to journey forward in the life of of the prophet Elisha. And we're going to look at key moments in his ministry and what we can learn from those about our own walk of faith. And at some level, every person's journey of faith begins with a call. And that call may look different for each one of us. For some of us, that call to follow Jesus may mark a clear turning point in our life, a 180 degree turn. Maybe there's a moment of crisis or of change or of decision. We feel an overwhelming sense of our need for Jesus. We offer ourselves to him and and everything changes. People notice there's a difference in our lives because we serve a new master. We are living for something different. For others of us, this call to follow Jesus may come more gently, more more quietly, and more gradually in our lives. Perhaps it's perhaps it's hard to pinpoint a specific moment when Jesus was calling us, because perhaps for many of us, so much of the early part of lives was one long process of calling, where we heard through the voices of parents or Sunday school teachers or relatives or friends. We hear about Jesus, and their influence helps to set us from a young age on the path of discipleship with childlike childlike faith. And for many of us, the the call of Christ comes in in different ways, and what he calls us to may differ depending on uh, who we are and how he decides to use us. After all, Jesus calls us to serve him in different ways. And he doesn't just call us to the life of faith, he calls us throughout the life of faith. And, And that overarching call includes many different calls along the way as we follow after him. Some of us can point to a moment where we sensed a clear call to a certain job, a certain line of work, or a certain community where we were to live. Some of you perhaps felt a call to marry a certain person, or maybe not to marry a certain person, depending on the circumstances. Maybe some of us have experienced a call to a particular avenue of ministry or of service. Perhaps the Lord's call in our life has come all at once. Perhaps it's come out of a time of prayer or reflection. Perhaps it's come as a result of hearing directly from the Lord, or or maybe just a quiet but steady tug on the heart leading us in a particular way. For many, it's easiest to point back to moments, as we're looking in hindsight, where we recognize that where we are now, we've gotten to because the Lord was calling us to go there. As we reflect on the call of the Lord this morning, we're going to begin by looking at Elisha's call, as Pastor Aaron described, to follow his mentor, Elijah. Then we're going to focus on Simon Peter's call to follow Jesus, and we'll end by taking a look at the call that Jesus extends to each and every one of us, the call to follow him, to receive the new life that he offers and that only he can give. We begin this morning by considering that moment of Elisha's call of faith. We find Elisha's origin story, or his call to life and ministry, recorded in these final verses of 1 Kings chapter 19. 
Elijah, the man who would become Elisha's teacher and mentor, has had quite a few ups and downs in the verses leading up to this. In chapter 18, Elijah had his famous showdown, his confrontation on Mount Carmel with the prophets of Baal. And then in the following chapter, much of chapter 19 is spent with Elijah's equally poignant confrontation with the Lord himself. When Elijah fled to the wilderness and uh, God confronted him in that cave. And out of that conversation with the Lord, Elijah comes here to anoint Elisha to be his successor. Now, I, I know already we've mentioned these names, and it's so confusing, Elijah, Elisha, why do they have to sound so similar? I know you guys already have to put up with Pastor Aaron and Pastor Andrew. Our names start with the same letters. Half of our clothes are the same. Shoot, sometimes even I can't tell us apart. So the last thing I want to do is place an additional burden on all of you this morning. And, and if you're ever wondering, you know, either of us will answer pretty much any name that starts with A. So, you know, don't, don't feel any pressure. Uh, but if it helps you remember here, you, you know, the, the time-tested memory technique is the letter J comes before the letter S. So Elijah comes before Elisha. If that helps awesome if I've just confused you even more than forget anything that I just said. So picking up here in chapter 19, verse 19, we read, So Elijah went from there and found Elisha, son of Shaphat. He was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen. Now, that would have been a considerable sign of wealth in those days. And he himself, Elisha, was driving the 12th pair. So he was a man of means, but not afraid to get his hands dirty. Elijah went up to him and threw his cloak around him. Now, what incredible moment that must have been. As far as we know, Elisha had no reason to suspect that there was a prophet who was coming for him. That day began, much as any other, he, he got up, he went out to the fields to work with the hired hands, he was minding his own business, doing the work that was in front of him, and out of nowhere, this kind of wild-eyed prophet comes up and places his coat on his shoulders and just keeps walking, and Elisha is left to figure out what on earth just happened. And while that sounds really bizarre to us, he would have understood what that meant, that the placing of a of robe or cloak would have signified the office or the job that that uh, went along with. So Elisha knew, okay, this guy wants me to follow after him. This guy wants me to take on the role and the identity that he has had. And so while this verse appears really sudden and almost jarring, at the same time, this is the outworking of God's activity over an extended period of time. There's a lot that has gone into this moment. A few verses earlier, during Elijah's conversation with the Lord at the cave, the older prophet had expressed his despair, his sense of giving up. He was feeling that Israel had utterly lost its way, that the worship of the one true God was on the verge of being stamped out, that he was the only faithful one who was left, and that godly religion would die with him. And so how did God respond to these feelings of despair and panic from Elijah? Did God pat Elijah on the back, or did he wipe his tears and say, there, there, Elijah? D did God say, you know what, Elijah, you're right. You are my only hope. I don't know what I'm going to do without you. No, God didn't say any of those things. Instead, instead of joining in Elijah's sense of despair and hopelessness, God focuses on the job that needs to be done, and he gives Elijah a job to do, a job that will actually pull Elijah out of his narrative of despair and draw him back into God's bigger story. 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 15 through 18, the Lord said to him, go back the way you came and go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Hazael king over Aram, also anoint Jehu son of Nimshi king over Israel, and anoint Elisha son of Shaphat from Abel Mechalah to succeed you as a prophet. He has a mouthful of names right there. And then he goes on to say, Jehu will put to death any who escape the sword of Hazael, 
and Elisha will put to death any who escape the sword of Jehu. Yet I reserve, and here's the heart of the matter, I reserve 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal and whose mouths have not kissed him. In other words, God is saying to Elijah here, nobody, you're actually not the only one left. Hope does not rise or fall with you. In fact, I happen to have 7,000 faithful followers that you don't even know about. And Elijah, not only are you replaceable, but from this moment onward, you're actually going to begin training your replacement. And he's going to carry on your work after you're gone. These wicked regimes that are perpetuating injustice and wickedness and bloodshed, they are going to fall. And yes, you will play a role in setting those dominoes into motion. But no, you're not going to see that day for yourself. For now, Elijah, just trust me. Just do the things I'm telling you to do, and I will take care of the rest. Now, incidentally, I, th I think these words actually have a lot to say to us as well in our particular cultural moment, because I, I think a lot of the time we are really tempted to feel like Elijah and to give in to despair. It's easy for us at times to feel like evil is on the rise. It's easy for us to feel like the faithful are dwindling and that we are on the verge of losing so much. And when we start to feel that way, we need to remember that God is still on his throne, that God still has his people, that God is indeed raising up the next generation, and that God will carry out his work into the future, even if we don't get to see it, or if the future that God has in mind doesn't exactly line up with the future that we have in mind. And so when we, too, feel that we're on the verge of throwing in the towel, God's word for us is simply trust me. Do the things that I am telling you to do, and I will take care of the rest. So while the events of chapter 19, verse 19, when Elijah appears to Elisha out of the blue, while they appear sudden or spontaneous from Elisha's point of view, there is a lot going on behind the scenes that came together in that moment when Elisha felt the weight of Elijah's cloak coming to rest upon his shoulders. Reflecting on the way that even seemingly chance encounters can nevertheless be the vehicle of God's eternal purposes, Bible scholar Dale Ralph Davis observes that suddenness, he says, is the wrapping paper in which sovereignty sometimes arrives. And that's a beautiful way to put it. Could it be that what may appear to us to be a sudden occurrence or a spur-of-the-moment decision might actually be the hand of God bringing about events that have been generations in the making. As we begin to glimpse the world more and more through the eyes of faith, we find that God indeed works in unexpected places and that things are not always what they seem to be. So there Elisha is. He is standing at the plow with Elijah's cloak on his back. And whether it took him a moment to collect himself and realize what was going on or whether he had to, you know, stop and secure his oxen, by the time that Elisha responds to Elijah, the prophet has already moved far enough away that Elisha has to run just to catch up with him. Picking up at verse 20, Elisha then left his oxen and ran after Elijah. Let me kiss my father and mother goodbye, he said, and then I will come with you. Go back, Elijah replied. What have I done to you? Now, that kind of sounds like maybe a standoffish response, but uh, the, the force of what Elijah is saying is really, well, I'm not stopping you. There, there's nothing preventing you. Yes, do what you need to do. Say those goodbyes and then come with me. And so that's what Elisha does. Verse 21, so Elisha left him and went back. He took his yoke of oxen and slaughtered them. He burned the plowing equipment to cook the meat and gave it to the people, and they ate. Now, now was, there, was there other food at hand to feed the people? Yeah, probably. Was there other wood available to, uh, to kindle the fire? Absolutely. Why is he doing this? It's a statement that he's leaving everything behind. There's no turning back. 
And then we read at the end of the verse, he set out to follow Elijah and became his servant. Now that's a response of faith. Without hesitating, without turning back, Elisha is willing to sever ties to his past and to his home. He is leaving behind a life of security and stability. He's probably a man of means. He has a family that cares about him, and he's leaving all of this behind, his family, his livelihood, his training, his entire world. He's leaving it all behind for the sake of following this call. After this farewell party, Elisha disappears into Elijah's shadow. I mean, he's, he's with Elijah as the prophet continues his ministry, but we don't see Elisha's name pop up again until several chapters later in 2 Kings chapter 2 when Elijah is taken up to heaven and significantly enough, his cloak is there left behind and Elisha picks up the cloak and that is his now, the symbol of his ministry that God has called him to do. And so, so what exactly did Elisha do during this time? Well, our passage here says that he was Elijah's servant. A, a, another place, 2 Kings chapter 3, verse 11, describes this training period like this. Uh, this is a, a comment in passing in uh, chapter 3, verse 11 of 2 Kings. An officer of the king of Israel answered, Elisha, son of Shaphat, is here. He used to pour water on the hands of Elijah. Now pouring water, that's servant's work. So during the season of his life, if, Elijah, if Elisha had had a business card or a resume, it would have said something along the lines of, Elisha, son of Shaphat, full-time prophet servant. Skills, plowing, burning things, <laughs> pouring water on the hands of my boss. And there have to have been moments where Elisha thought, really, I left behind my comfortable life for this? Really? God, is this all that you have in store for me? Couldn't someone else have done this job just as well? But yet, that was God's call. That was the path that he needed to follow in order to become the leader that God had called him to be. According to Scripture, the only true kind of leadership is servant leadership. That's what Jesus taught his disciples, and that remains true today. Reflecting on this passage, the great Bible commentator Matthew Henry writes, those that would be fit to teach must have time to learn, and those that hope hereafter to rise and rule must be willing at first to stoop and to serve. So as we consider Elisha's call of faith and the season of life that that calling led him to, Scripture reminds us to be patient. There are no shortcuts to serving Jesus. The journey itself is where he meets us, where he shapes us, where he equips us. Without the lessons that we learn on the journey, we're pretty useless when we get to the destination. And so, friends, as you hear God's call on your life, as you respond to that call, be excited, be passionate, go all in, but also be patient. Be willing to do things that God calls you to do that maybe you think, that's not what I was signing up for. If that's what God wants you to do, and if you're following him, then that's exactly what you're signing up for. Don't be impatient to rush off and do great things for God. Just obey just follow. When I was a first-year student in college, one of the speakers on campus said some words that as a first-year college student eager to go and make my mark on the world, I really needed to hear. And those words were, God might use you to change the world, but he probably won't. <laughs> he may be more interested in changing you. And that's the lesson that we all need to learn, to be willing to let God work in our hearts in the slow, the ordinary, the mundane seasons of life, that's where the image of Jesus Christ is formed within us. Second, the calling of Elisha and this overlap between Elijah's and Elisha's ministries remind us that the God who acts so suddenly and decisively is also the God who plays the long game. So like Elijah, you may never get to see the full work of your life through to completion, but that's okay, because it's not truly your work, it's 
his work, and he is committed to carrying that work on. So simply be faithful and obey. Trust in him and have the eyes of faith to see beyond your own circumstances and imagine what God might bring about. As we consider Elisha's call to follow the Lord, there are aspects of this call that are both similar to and different from Jesus' call to his disciples. Let's compare this for a moment with Simon's call of faith in Luke chapter 5. Picking up right there at the beginning of the chapter, Luke tells us, one day as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, that's the Sea of Galilee, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He, Jesus, saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. Now, Simon is better known to us by the other name, Peter, that Jesus gave to him, but that doesn't happen until Luke chapter 9, so we'll refer to him as our text does as Simon. And unlike the calling of Elisha, which happened in an instant, the calling of Simon seems to happen in stages. As Jesus gets into the boat belonging to Simon in Luke chapter 5, this isn't the first time that he has interacted with Simon. Just one chapter before, in Luke 4, 38, Jesus is reported to have been at Simon's house where he healed his mother-in-law from a high-grade fever. And in fact, the original meeting between Jesus and Simon isn't recorded in Luke's gospel at all. We find that in John's gospel, in John chapter 1, verse 42, where Simon's brother Andrew, who had been part of John the baptizer's group of followers, had heard about Jesus from John and thought, hey, this guy really does look like he's the Messiah. And then he introduced his brother Simon but as we see, Simon maybe took a little bit more time to convince uh, than his brother took. So what's the point here with all of this backstory? Simply this, that Simon has met with Jesus. Simon has interacted with Jesus at least a couple times before. And Jesus is a familiar person now to Simon, perhaps even someone that Simon has come to like and respect. But Simon isn't following Jesus, not yet. He, he's, he's kind of a fan of Jesus. He's interested in what Jesus has to say, but he is still very much focused on his old life as a fisherman. So in Luke chapter 5, we see Jesus pursuing Simon by asking for his help. At Jesus' request, Simon stops what he's doing, and he provides his boat as a floating platform for Jesus while he teaches. Continuing on in verses 4 and 5, when he, Jesus, had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've, heard, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I'll let down the nets. Now, from a human point of view, Simon had absolutely zero reason to follow Jesus' instructions. Simon has already been out fishing all night. He's already cleaned his nets. He was probably exhausted and ready to go home and sleep. But Jesus is now asking him, after Simon already took time out of his day to help Jesus, Jesus is now asking him to get his equipment back out to go back into the sea and to go fishing again. Now, if Jesus were an expert fisherman, maybe that would be something to take seriously. But he's not. He's a carpenter. Leave the fishing to the pros. Stay in your lane, Jesus. But that's not how Simon reacted. And instead, Simon did what Jesus said to do. Maybe by now, Jesus had built enough of a relationship with Simon that Simon thought, okay, I'll, I'll give this a try. Maybe Simon is just being polite and humoring Jesus, saying, okay, this is a waste of time, but it's just easier if I do it this way. I'm not going to argue with him. Or, or maybe there was just something about Jesus that, that made Simon feel compelled to go on a limb go out on a limb and do something that he normally wouldn't do. So, so, so he goes along with it. He submits to Jesus' directions. And what happens next? Verse 6, when they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. 
When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Now, even though this catch of fish was miraculous, Simon's reaction tells us that the real miracle here is happening in his heart. In this moment, the enormity of who Jesus is has stopped Simon in his tracks and has brought him to his knees in genuine penitence. Jesus has drawn Simon to the point where he is ready to renounce his old identity that he's been holding on to and to turn to something new. As Bible scholar William Hendrickson points out, when one is confronted with Jesus, it is impossible to remain neutral. You can't stay in one place. You either have to go forward or go backward. You either have to acknowledge him and bow before him, or you have to run away and try to suppress that knowledge of who he is. Sooner or later, we get to the point where we have to take a stand or make a choice. Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote, because Christ exists, he must be followed. That simply because of who Jesus is, the majesty and the authority that he possesses, the only response to him that makes sense for us is to say, yes, Lord, we will go where you go. We will do what you do. You are our all. You are the master. You are the Lord. You are worthy of our everything. And, and so Simon had that moment of confrontation. He finally saw Jesus for who he was, and in a moment of pure surrender, he fell down before him, and continuing on, then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. Different process from Elisha, but same results, leaving everything behind to follow the call. Simon realized that all the time he had been working to catch fish, Jesus was working to catch him. It turns out that Jesus was a better fisherman than Simon had realized, for even as Simon and his partners were securing all those fish, Jesus had secured them. Not just as trophies of his grace, but now as partners in his mission and in his work. Jesus, the original fisher of men, is now calling them to follow after him and learn his ways so that they can fish for people too. So having looked at Elisha's call of faith and Simon Peter's call of faith, what can we learn about our own call of faith? Maybe some of us see similarities between parts of Elisha's story or Simon's story and our own stories. Perhaps some of us, like Elisha, have had moments where God speaks into our lives suddenly and decisively, prompting us to change course quickly and dramatically. That's how God tends to work in my wife's life. He'll put something in front of Mary, and she'll recognize his voice right away and say, okay, God, and she'll follow him without giving it a, a second thought. I tend to be a little bit more like Simon. God speaks to me in stages. He gradually draws me over time where he's calling me to go. And, and so for better or worse, I, I make wide turns. But once you have turned the vehicle, there's no going back. We're, we're moving in that direction. And, and all of us, you know, some of us are that way. Some of us are, are different. But even though certain aspects of Elisha's call and Simon's calls were different, there's a lot that's the same. Both of them had to leave behind their homes their families, their, their livelihood for the sake of something that was unknown, that was unfamiliar, that was really unglamorous. The call of faith is a call to a gritty life of service and humility. It's a call to lay everything down because Jesus is worth everything, and he's worth so much more than everything. So how did Jesus describe this call of faith? Looking ahead to Luke chapter 9, after Simon expresses his conviction that, that this Jesus he's been following now is in fact the Christ, the Son of God, Jesus then tells the disciples very bluntly that he came to earth to suffer, to die, and to be raised to life on the third day. And then, as if this teaching was not already hard enough, Jesus told them that if they were serious about following him, 
Well, the same thing would happen to them too. They would have to suffer. They would have to lay down their lives for the sake of that call. Luke chapter 9, verses 23 and 24. Then he said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. And this is the line that Jesus has drawn in the sand. To cross this line, to follow him, is to leave everything behind, to sign away our rights to ourselves, to consider all things as lost for the sake of knowing Christ Jesus. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the brilliant German theologian whose own commitment to following Jesus would eventually cost him his earthly life as well, he wrote these words in his landmark work, The Cost of Discipleship. And he knew a lot about the cost of discipleship. Bonhoeffer wrote, The first Christ suffering that everyone has to experience is the call which summons us away from our attachments to this world. It is the death of the old self in the encounter with Jesus Christ. Those who enter into discipleship enter into Jesus' death. They turn their living into dying. Such has been the case, Bonhoeffer says, from the very beginning. The cross is not the terrible end of a pious, happy life. Instead, it stands at the beginning of community with Jesus Christ. Whenever Christ calls us, his call leads us to death. That last sentence is also sometimes translated as, whenever Christ calls a man or a woman, he bids them come and die. And that sums up what it means to follow Jesus, to leave everything behind. It is no longer we who live, but Christ who lives in us. But as Jesus' own very words remind us, whoever loses their life for Jesus gains so much more. That's because what we lose is really just an illusion of something. But what we gain is something real, something that will last, something that will sustain us and give us a deeper, richer life than anything that we could ever imagine. When we lay down everything for Jesus, we receive something else. We receive Christ himself. We're united with him in his death, and we're united with him in his resurrection. The power of sin loses its dominion over us. Death loses its sting. Instead, we are filled with the life of Christ. We're adopted into God's family. We are forgiven of our sins and set free. We're given something new to live for. And Jesus wants us to understand this. That's why in those final hours that he spent with his disciples, he shared that one last meal with them. As the ultimate servant leader, Jesus knelt down and he washed their feet and he instructed them to do likewise. As he reclined at the table with them, breaking bread and drinking the fruit of the vine, he presented to them the bread and the cup as a symbol, as a teaching of what it was he was about to do for them. And also as something that they were to continue to do in remembrance of him afterwards. He gave us something that has continued to this very day. That as we receive the bread and the cup at the Lord's table, we are reminded of why he came. We're reminded of his promise of new life to all who believe. And we are also strengthened and nourished to live this life of faith. As we receive from the Lord's table this morning, we remind you, friends, that this is not merely a Presbyterian table. This is the table of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This table is open to all who profess Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord, to all who seek to follow him in that life of faith. If, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, or if you're walking out of step with him at this time, we do ask, friends, that you not receive from the table today, that you, you sit this one out and that you use this time to ponder and to pray, to reflect, to consider this Jesus that when we encounter him, we're left with no neutral ground. And he asks us, what is it going to be? Will you follow or will you not? Our prayer for you, friends, is that it, as you encounter Christ, you'll come to know his love and his grace and an overwhelming desire to leave everything behind and follow him. If you know Jesus Christ, 
if he is your Savior and Lord, if you're making an effort to, to follow after him and live for him, don't feel like you have to have it all figured out. Don't get the wrong idea. This is not the table for those who are perfect or flawless. This is the table for those who are hungry, that they might find food. For those who are sick, that they might find healing. For those who are lost, that they may be found. This is a table for those who come to Christ knowing that there's nowhere else to turn to, that he alone has the words of eternal life, and that in him alone is found true joy, true hope, and true satisfaction. And so as we prepare to receive from the Lord's table today, brothers and sisters, I ask that you would pray with me as we prepare our hearts. Heavenly Father, we pause in your presence this morning. We give you thanks for your, thanks for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your love, which is poured out for us on the cross. As we receive, Lord, this spiritual feast of the bread and the cup this morning, we ask, Lord, that you would bless this bread and that you would bless this cup. They are but the ordinary stuff of earth. They have no power. There's nothing special in them. But, Lord, we ask by your Spirit's power that they would become for us this morning a means of grace, that as we receive them, we would receive the hope that Christ offers that as we feed upon them, we would feed upon your word and your spirit would nourish and strengthen us. Lord, for those of us who are tired, we ask that you would give us strength. For those of us, Lord, who are struggling to hold on, we ask that you would give us hope. For those of us with doubts and questions, we ask that those questions and doubts would lead us closer into your arms. Lord, help us to see you, to know you, and to be strengthened to follow you this morning. We pray all of these things in the mighty name of your Son, Jesus Christ, and by the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen.